Good morning, church. It is uh, so good to see everybody on this bright Sunday morning. And uh, I just want to uh, thank everybody for coming out, those of you who did, to the Cornhole Tournament on Friday night, which was a lot of fun. Congrats, obviously, to Steve and his partner Wes for winning the tournament. Steve uh, opted out of the Tokyo Olympics so that he could play in a cornhole tournament here, and so uh, it was a privilege to uh, compete against him. But uh, in all seriousness, we, we raised probably about $1,400 or so, all of which, yeah, I know, praise the Lord, all of which will be given to Northeast Elementary to help students and teachers with various needs, whether it be snacks or clothing or school supplies or writing utensils as kind of a benevolence. And so, uh, you know, that's really the only victory I cared about on Friday night. So, uh, thank you for being part of that. Well, it's not... It's not totally true, I guess. I, I got a lot of joy out of giving Janice a beat down on the cornhole tournament, so that was, that was a lot of fun, so, and her partner, Ben, of course, but. Uh, yes, I, I got a retired professional basketball player to be my partner, so uh, suffice to say, his back is a bit sore this morning from carrying all the weight, but. It's all good. He can deal with it. If you have your Bibles, we are in Mark chapter 9 today. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through Mark chapter 9, verse 14, says, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, For he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And when they brought the boy to him, And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and water to destroy him. But if he can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Let me open us with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you now just acknowledging how helpless and broken we are apart from you. 
Lord, you say in your word that apart from you, we can do nothing. So, Lord, we lean on you. We ask that you would be our strength, that you would be our guide. Lord, I pray that we would cling to the hope that is in Jesus Christ, that we would rejoice in the salvation that we have in Christ alone. I pray, Lord, that as we dig into this text here for a bit this morning, that you would just open our eyes to the supremacy and the excellency and the wonder of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would just speak to us through your passage. I pray that you'd speak to us through your word. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen our faith in this study together that you would move us into obedience for your name. Lord, help me to not go off the deep end in the sermon this morning or say anything that would be misleading, but I just pray that you would speak through me. We love you so much, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as we look at this passage this morning, I realize that it might seem somewhat irrelevant to some of us here this morning. Uh, Jesus heals a boy with a demon. Most of the story revolves around a father with this boy who has a demon. And I'm sure there are probably some in here, and we know that there are many uh, people in our world today, even in churches, who don't even believe in demons. They don't even believe in anything spiritual. Uh, They confine everything to the natural realm, we may call it, and they look at these gospel accounts as if they are outdated and, uh, you know, a superstitious worldview 2,000 years ago. And so what can this text teach us today? To that point, I would just make one comment, uh, namely that the gospel writers had what I would call a balanced view. They had a balanced view. Unlike the rest of the ancient world, the Gospels attribute some problems and some suffering to demonic activity and some suffering to natural causes. To give you a case in point, you don't have to turn there, but the book of Matthew, in chapter 4, verse 24, gives a summary of the ministry of Jesus. And this is what it says. It says that the fame of Jesus spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And so I would say if the Bible has a balanced view on demons and spiritual warfare, I think it's reasonable for us to have a view like that too. I think it's somewhat unreasonable to have the, what I would consider an extreme view, and attribute literally everything in this world to the demonic activity and spiritual warfare, and I think the other extreme view would would be to say that it doesn't exist at all. There's no existence whatsoever All our problems are just from natural causes and suffering. With that being said, I actually find this passage here this morning to be more relatable, at least to my own personal life, than probably most of the passages we've looked at in the Gospel of Mark. You wonder, well, what in the world could we learn from this passage? We've already seen the supremacy of Christ in exercising demons and having authority over all creation. What more can we glean from this passage? But I would say this. This passage in particular puts a great emphasis on faith. It puts a great emphasis on faith, our need for faith. And so with that being said, it's probably too too long to go verse by verse this morning and look through every verse. So let me just make three general points in our time together today, three points that I think this text teaches us on the necessity of faith. And those three points would be this. The need for Christ 
how we come for Christ, or how we come to Christ, and the confidence we have in Christ. Why do we need Christ? How do we come to Christ? And the confidence that we have in Christ. Those would be my three points, along with just a few side points that I wanted to throw in this morning. Why the need for Christ? Simply put, because the world does not have solutions to all the biggest problems we have in life. The need for Christ is this, that there's no hope in the world for all the biggest problems that we have in life. So imagine if you're the father here in this story, and you have this son, of which Luke chapter 9 says it's his only son. And this father had to watch probably for years as his son suffered and lived in misery because of a demon. And can you imagine how helpless this father must have felt not being able to do anything about it? Can you imagine that as a parent? It'd be brutal. And there is this great crowd around this father, and yet nobody else can do anything about it. Nobody else can help this boy. We're even told in verse 19 that not even the disciples could help this boy. Verse 18, excuse me. Beyond all hope, right? One person brings hope to this father. In this great crowd of people, there's only one person who brings hope to this father. And obviously, you know who it is. It's our Lord Jesus Christ. I might venture to say that all the progress in our world today, some 2,000 years removed, has only shown us just how broken and helpless we are. Here's what I mean by this. We have it really good in our society, don't we? I mean, you think about it. We have cutting-edge technology and medicine. We have the best doctors, the best counselors, the best psychologists. There are endless opportunities for education, for career advancement. We have family and friends and loved ones at just, what, nine digits away. A phone call away and we can reach anybody for help. There are countless self-help books. We've advanced so much in science and other fields of studies. And yet, in spite of all of our efforts to fix humanity, there is just as much, if not more, brokenness and suffering and hurt and abuse, drugs, there is so much brokenness in this world that all of it goes to show that there is no hope in this world. In spite of all of our efforts to try and fix ourselves, we realize that we're just as broken as ever before. There's just as much violence on the streets as ever before in spite of all the education and the awareness that we've raised about different social justice issues. You know what that tells me? It tells me that the solution that we're looking for in this life isn't found in the world. The hope that we're looking for can't be found in the world or anything in the world. It surely can't be found in your work or in your friends or in whatever idols we have in this world. We need to find a solution that lies outside this world, that lies beyond this world. We need to find our hope in somebody who has overcome the world and everything in it, including even sin and death itself. And there's only one person who's proven to do that. Jesus Christ, by his resurrection from the dead, has proven himself to be greater than the world and everything in it. That is why we need Jesus. He isn't limited to this brokenness. He is overcome it by his death and his resurrection. And if our hope isn't in Jesus, if he isn't the answer to all of our problems, we're never going to find the answer because it doesn't exist outside of Christ. 
This is why we need Jesus. This is why we come to him in faith. Now, the problem in this passage seems to be that nobody gets that. Nobody understands the need for faith in Jesus. Look at what Jesus says in verse 19. He said, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Jesus isn't rebuking the crowds and the disciples for not being able to cast out a demon. He's exasperated because nobody has faith in him. He has been around this crowd and these disciples for so long, and yet they're still living as if they can do everything on their own strength. And even the disciples are living like this. I think this is why Jesus says what he does here at the end of the chapter. When the disciples ask Jesus why they couldn't drive out this demon, you know what he says? He says, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. What is Jesus getting at here? I think he's rebuking the disciples for trying to operate on their own strength. They're trying to go through life, they're trying to do ministry, and yet they're doing it as if they have no dependence whatsoever on the Lord himself, and they're failing. That's the problem. John 15, 5, which I prayed earlier, says that apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Do we believe that? Or are we still trying to convince ourselves that we can go through this life on our own apart from Christ? Hence the need for faith in Christ. This is why we need Jesus. Second point, how do we come to Jesus how do we come to Jesus? Not in perfection, but in desperation. Not in perfection, but in desperation. This father of this son came to Jesus looking for help. He was desperate. And yet, do you notice that he didn't give Jesus any reasons why Jesus should help him? He didn't come to Jesus and say, look, I've been a really good father all, all these years. You owe it to me. Look, I've really lived a good life. I deserve just this one favor from you. No, the father doesn't say anything like that, does he? Instead, he comes to Jesus not trusting in his own goodness, but he's trusting in the goodness of Christ. He's leaning on the compassion of Christ for help. It has nothing to do with his own goodness or lack thereof. We see in Scripture, all throughout Scripture, God saves people only because of his grace and his compassion, and it has nothing to do with our efforts, how good or bad we are. In fact, you read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and the point couldn't be more obvious. God didn't save us when we were at our best. God didn't save us because of our efforts to please him or to live a good life before him. It's actually the exact opposite. You read Ephesians 2, and the point is this. God saved us at our very worst. He made us alive with Christ when we were dead in our sins under the wrath of God, following the ways of the world. We're just going through this life like a corpse. And we did nothing whatsoever for God to save us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 goes on, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is a gift of God. It's not of yourselves, so nobody may boast. It's not of work. In spite of this, and in spite of the precedent of Scripture, for whatever reason, so many Christians have this mindset that we have to, like, clean up our act for God to bless us, right? It's like we have to earn God's favor. It's like God would never save us. He would never be compassionate to us unless it's like we wash our hands and clean up our life. And, you know, it's really unfortunate because this is completely backwards, it's backwards thinking. It's backwards to the gospel. By way of analogy, consider parents for just a minute. 
For those of you who are parents, when your child is suffering, when your child makes mistakes, when he gets himself in the hot water, when he just wrecks his life, you wouldn't want your child to hide that from you, would you? You wouldn't want your child to clean up his act first, to try and figure out life on his own and then come to you and then explain everything to you and start a relationship with you. No, you would never want that for your child. Why? Because you love your child. You care about your children. And you delight in helping them. Your way of loving your children is helping them through their mistakes and their suffering and their hurt and their pain. That's what gives you joy as a parent. And so does it make sense to look at our Heavenly Father, who is so much more gracious and loving and compassionate than any earthly parents we've ever had, and think that he would treat us any differently? That we need to clean up our act and then come to him as if we could? No. We have a Heavenly Father who loves us, who knows what we're going through, and he just wants us to come to him, not in perfection, because nobody's perfect, nor could we ever be. But he wants us to come to him in, his, in our desperation, in our sin, in our hurt, in our pain. And he delights in helping his children. He delights in caring for those who would come to him in faith. And so this is how we come to Christ. Not in perfection, but in desperation. Not in holiness, but in neediness. Not with our resumes, but with our wreckage. Before we go on to our third point, let me just make a couple side points here that I think we see in the text. It's really interesting. If you look at the beginning of Mark, chapter 1, verse 40 through 45, we already looked at this, the leper. The leper comes to Jesus, and he implores Jesus to heal him, and he says, if you are willing, you can make me well. The leper knew that Jesus had the power to heal him, but he questioned the willingness of Jesus. You move on here to Mark chapter 9, and this father comes to Jesus, and he says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us. In other words, the father was the opposite of the leper. He knew that Jesus was compassionate, and that he had the desire to help, but he questioned the ability of Jesus. If you hold those stories together side by side, what you see is that Jesus has both the ability to heal whoever comes to him, and he has the willingness to do so. If Jesus did not have both of these qualities, we would be absolutely hopeless. Because we need a Savior who not only has the power to save us, but who has the willingness to do so. But this begs the question, why is it that this father here in Mark chapter 9 questioned the ability of Jesus? Why is he said, if you can do anything heal my son. Where do you think this came from? I think the only reasonable answer is found straight in the text itself. Surely the father questioned the ability of Jesus to heal his son because the followers of Jesus could not heal his son. He saw what the followers of Jesus were doing or what they couldn't do, and that shaped his view on Jesus himself. Here's the point that I'm trying to get across, and it's at least hitting home with me. The opinions that people have of us as followers of Christ will dramatically affect the opinions that they have of Jesus himself. What they think of you will dramatically affect what they think of Jesus. So, Here's how that plays out. If you want people to be turned off at the thought of Jesus and his glorious gospel, if you want to put a sour taste in their mouth for Jesus, just be a jerk to them. As simple as that. 
On the other hand, if you want people to understand the love of Christ, then love those people like Christ. If you want people to understand the mercy of Christ, then be merciful. If you want people to understand the patience and the compassion, the goodness of Christ, then let your life be characterized by patience and compassion and goodness. Live your life in such a way that when people see you, they fall in love not with you, but with the Jesus who saved you. How we live, what we do, will dramatically impact how people see the Jesus who we claim to believe in and who we claim to have saved our souls for all eternity. The second side point would just be this. You know what? It's really okay to have doubts. It's, it's really okay to have doubts and to have certain degrees of unbelief. And I say that because, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in, like, some Christian circles where, like, there's just certain Christians that are just so on fire for Jesus and they're so convicted about everything that like, you almost feel intimidated to be around them and, like, you like something's off with your own faith and you really can't express yourself. Like, man, I'm really kind of having questions here and, and there and I'm wrestling with this whole gospel thing, this whole Christianity thing. Look, it's really okay to have doubts, to have unbelief. And you don't have to hide that. You can be honest about it. This father here was completely honest and open about his unbelief. Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. Quite frankly, you can't convince yourself to believe in something. No matter how hard you try, you can't convince yourself to believe in something. If I gave you ten facts about Bigfoot, where he lived, what he does, what he eats, you still can't convince yourself to believe in Bigfoot. You might say you do, but you know... Deep down, you still don't believe that Bigfoot exists. Unfortunately, none of you have seen him like I have, so you don't have that belief, okay? Just kidding. It's like my wife, you know? No, 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 Dom, let me clarify this. I was not comparing my wife to Bigfoot, okay? I just want the record to be set straight here. Yes. What I was going to say was that even if everybody else in this room is convinced that I'm like the best singer ever in the history of music, and I have an angelic voice that came straight from heaven, she still doesn't believe me. And I can't convince her to believe me. Belief isn't something that you can just generate on your own strength. So what do you do about your unbelief? What do you do about your doubts? I would just say, do what this guy did here in Mark chapter 9. Pray about it. Ask Jesus for help. What's wrong with that? It's okay to be honest. Man, Lord, I believe in you, but I'm really struggling in this area. Help me with my unbelief. Help me with my uncertainty. Help me with these things I'm wrestling with I just can't get a grip on. Show me your will. Show me yourself. It's really okay. Just pray that. Ask the Lord for help. All right, third point. The confidence we have before Christ, or the confidence that we have in Christ. It's really interesting here. Jesus tells this father in verse 23, he says, all things are possible for the one who believes. All things are possible for the one who believes. Now, surely there's some hyperbole in this statement, right? Surely not all things are possible for the one who believes, or else I would have a million dollars, and I would have worn cornhole the other night. But I didn't, right? So I don't think that's what Jesus is getting at. But then that begs the question, what is Jesus getting at? What is the point he's making to this father here? And I think that the point that Jesus is trying to get across to this father is that God will never hold back anything good from those who come to him in faith. God's never going to shortchange somebody who comes to him in faith. 
He's never going to give somebody only half of his best, half of his blessing, half of his grace. No. He's going to give us every heavenly gift from above those who would come to him in faith. All things are possible for the one who comes to him in faith. This same Jesus, who told this man here in Mark chapter 9 that all things are possible for the one who comes to him in faith, probably about eight months later, in Mark chapter 14, after the Last Supper, on the evening of his betrayal, on the night before he was crucified, I couldn't help but wrestle with what Jesus himself prayed. Listen to the words of Jesus as he is praying in the garden. You don't have to turn there, but listen to what he says in Mark chapter 14, verse 35. Going a little farther, Jesus fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, if it were possible, that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, or yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus knew what the cup represented. Throughout the Old Testament, the cup was a metaphor for suffering and for divine judgment upon the sin and the wickedness of mankind. That's what the cup symbolized. And Jesus, in his humanity, wanted nothing to do with it. He knew that the cross that laid ahead of him entailed the most horrific, painful suffering imaginable to man. And yet, there was no other way. That was the only possibility for Jesus. There was no other possible way for Jesus except the cross. Why is that? Because the whole reason why Jesus came into the world was to reconcile sinners to a holy and righteous God. And in order to do that, he had to take our sin upon himself. He had to pay the debt that we could never pay back in all eternity. You wonder how a good and holy and righteous God could ever give you his compassion, give you anything at all, in spite of all of our sin, all of our failures, all of our unworthiness, how could a good and loving God do that? Because Jesus Christ went to the cross for us, for our sin, and he paid our debt in full, a debt so large that none of us could ever pay back in all of eternity. We had a record of debt, according to Colossians 2, that stood against us, and we had no chance. We stood condemned before God. We stood forsaken by our Heavenly Father on account of our, our twisted hearts, our pride, our rebellion, all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our mistakes. And yet Jesus Christ went to that cross to take all of that upon himself. He gave up his life in our place for our sake, for our sin, so that by faith in him we could be forgiven in full. So that the righteousness of God could be imparted to those who come to Jesus Christ in faith. So that foreigners and sinners like us could become part of the family of God. Do you see the, all that Jesus has done for us? through his death and his resurrection? Do you see how much compassion he showed us? The extent that he went to to save us? He gave up his very life so that we could be redeemed, so that we could have hope in him. 
And if we believe that, right, if we see that, if we grab a hold of that, then surely we'll never doubt the goodness and the ability of Christ to save all who come to him in faith. Like this boy who was as good as dead and who Jesus lifted up into the newness of life, he's able to do that for everybody who would just come to him in faith, call upon his name. And that's the confidence that we have in Jesus Christ. And this is the hope of the gospel. So that being said, uh, let me close this in a word of prayer. Um, Before I do, as the worship team comes up, I suppose I should probably make a quick announcement. Maddie and I are going to go in this Tuesday morning and have baby number two. And uh, I know, right? I'm so excited. I am so excited. I cannot wait. Oh, she's going to be an angel. Oh, it's going to be awesome. With that being said, I'm going to take a couple Sundays off from the pulpit. We're going to be a C-section, so I'm just going to stay at home for a couple weeks and hang out there and take care of Judah. And I have a good friend who will be filling the pulpit next Sunday. His name is Dave Oldham. Uh, I'm excited for you to hear him preach. And then the Sunday after that, John Cannon will be uh, continuing our study in the Gospel of Mark. You're not going to want to miss that because I know it's going to be fantastic. So that being said, let me close this with a word of prayer. Uh, Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are able and you are willing to save anybody who would come to you in faith. In spite of how broken and sinful and helpless and undeserving we are, you shower your grace upon us. And we know that this is only on account of Jesus Christ, the righteous who gave up his life for the unrighteous. It's by his wounds that we're healed, Lord. And all we can just say is thank you. Thank you so much. We love you. We pray this all in your name. Amen. You would give us eyes to see the glory of Christ.